Next on The Broadway Show, Phantom Thread, the longest running musical in Broadway history is still breaking barriers. You meet the new Christines from Phantom of the Opera. The girl from the North Country, Kimber Lane Sprawl, is here to talk about an incredible musical experience inspired by the songs of Bob Dylan. And the comeback continues. We'll take you on stage for two more incredible Broadway comebacks. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. We're so glad you could be here for this totally jam-packed episode of The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Phantom of the Opera is Broadway's longest-running musical, but Andrew Lloyd Webber's masterpiece is making history once again. Here's Paul Wontorek with the story. Thanks, Tamsin. These angels of music are sharing an iconic Broadway part. Megan Pacerno is once again Christine Daae in The Phantom of the Opera, joined by newcomer Emily Coachu as an alternate in the role, making her the first black actress to play the part on Broadway. I met up with the talented ladies at the Renaissance Hotel's Art Lounge. Megan, let me start with you. Okay. You were performing in Phantom yes. when Broadway shut down. Yes. So you've been without Christine Daae, wishing you were somehow here again. Yes. She is. How does it feel? It's a little surreal. I'm like, like cautiously positive about everything. I don't yes. want to get too excited yet, but it feels amazing. Um, I mean, we're making history. Yeah. Uh, Team Christine is making history right mm -hmm. now, Team and Christine. we are historically returning. I mean, Phantom's never been shut down like this before, so it's it's quite a time to be alive, and it's amazing to be back. I'm I'm gonna cry a lot. <laughs> there is a Team Christine. That is a thing. There are a lot of it amazing mm -hmm. actresses mm -hmm. who have. Uh, played this role, Christine Dye in Phantom of the Opera. How does it feel to be joining their ranks, joining the club? I mean, it's surreal. I just, I feel so grateful. Um, this has been like a dream of mine for a long time. It's actually the first show I ever saw on Broadway. So this is kind of full circle for me. And it's special because I get to step into this role as the first black woman to play it. I'm honored that it's me. I'm honored that I get to carry on this legacy of this iconic role. Um, yeah, and I just feel great. I feel really good. You were a young girl when you mm -hmm. saw Phantom of the Opera, mm -hmm. when you, what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, when you see Christine Dye on stage, do you immediately think, that that's the role I should play? When I first saw it, I saw it from the nosebleed seats. So I didn't see anything. At that point, it was just like, it was more of a feeling of, this is what I want to do yeah. for the rest of my life. When it became clear to me that Christine was something that I could handle, was in college and I remember one of the casting directors for Phantom came to our school. We had meetings with him and I was like, I want to play Christine on Broadway. And at that point he was like, okay, sure. I've gotten already a few messages from girls who are younger than me who are like, I'm coming to see Phantom because of you. And like, that's really special for me because I mean, I, mean, I just think that theater should be for everyone. Megan, you came at this role a little differently. You came really more from the opera world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and because of Hal Prince, actually. So I, you probably saw Phantom before I did because I was doing uh, Candide at New York City Opera and he was my director mm -hmm. and, my, and uh, he was like, have you ever seen Phantom? And I was like, <laughs> I saw the movie, I saw the movie, but I was like, no, I haven't, and that was four years ago, so. Wow. What I think has been really interesting for me as a fan of this show, P-H-A-N, <laughs> is watching different actresses take on this role over time, and I feel like it used to be cast with very classic ingenue soprano <laughs> ladies, and over the years, I've seen much more women with so many different flavors taking on this part, which is what's so awesome about it. Our resident director um, actually talks about this a lot. Um, he was very specific about me not putting on any airs right. that I don't need to, that many uh, preconceived notions of who a woman was back in that time. Right. I am me, I am Emily playing this role. I can be grounded in who I am. I can speak like 
like how I speak. I really love that the growth in the show in that way. I really love that I can just be myself in Christine. I don't have to play Christine. This like, role has what? always been split between two actresses since mm -hmm. it first opened on Broadway. So you do six shows a week, you do two shows a mm -hmm. week, and you share the same dressing room. Mm -hmm. So are there any, how does that work? I mean, you've been through this before. Are there certain rules about the space? It is definitely a team, Christine. <laughs> um, so I had never replaced ever before in my life, and I was very lucky that um, my alternate at the time, Erin LaCroix, was just the sweetest. And she like took all her stuff down and she's like, girl, this is your dressing room, we'll share this and that. Um, it has been clean, but you should know that usually it's like a fairy threw up <laughs> in my room. Okay. So I like fairies. Unicorn and lots of lights. Seth always, Seth is our resident director and always comes in and he's like, oh my God, there's more in here? <laughs> I'll try to keep it, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe I'm a changed person post pandemic. Ain't Too Proud just made its Broadway return in a big way, and they celebrated by honoring an original member of The Temptations, Otis Williams, as he celebrated his 80th birthday. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Ain't Too Proud premiered on Broadway March 2019, and it was nominated for 12 Tony Awards, including a win for Best Choreography. Girl from the North Country is back, and it is magic. The show opened just days before the pandemic closed Broadway, and as of this month, the doors have officially reopened. Pistol cells ring out in the ballroom and into Patty Valentine from the upper hall. The show, inspired by music from one of the greatest songwriters in history, is now back at New York's Belasco Theater. Let's send it out to Charlie Cooper. Thanks, Tamsin. Girl from the North Country, featuring the songs of Bob Dylan, returns to Broadway. And with it comes leading lady Kimber Elaine Sprawl. We met at the Belasco Theater to chat about that and so much more. The show is about the Great Depression and yeah. really essentially needing community to get through such a difficult time. And it almost parallels a lot of what we just went through. Yeah. Do you feel like audiences will get something new out of it that maybe they couldn't get prior to the pandemic and the social unrest that's happened? For sure, for sure. I think our show continues to grow with the times. It's just such a slice of life and it's such a human piece that no matter what I'm going through, no matter what the world is going through, I really do feel like people relate to it. But especially now, I know when I was getting ready for the show and I was like doing research about the Great Depression, the biggest conundrum that I had was like, wow, these people went through something so catastrophic that I can't even imagine. I don't know, how, how do you do that? And then you realize when you, ex when you experience a pandemic, you're like, oh, you just, you, you do. You find ways to survive, you find community, you, you're eager to make connections, you're eager to laugh and, and have experiences. And that's super, that's more Girl from North Country. It's about finding love while trying to survive. So talk to me a little bit about your character and do you feel like you're going into this with a different perspective? Yeah, uh, I play Marianne Lane. She is a 19 year old woman. Uh, she finds herself in a very dramatic pregnancy and everyone is trying to tell her what to do, what her options, what her choices are. And she's a woman of strong conviction and resolve and she's just trying to figure it out for herself. She is adopted by a white family so she kind of goes through spouts of loneliness. She knows what her desires are, but it's confusing and, and lonesome when that doesn't reflect what you see every day. And, you know, it's, it doesn't reflect in her experiences as a black woman. Um, yeah, so she's just, she's on her journey. Has anybody seen my love? You want to talk to me? Go ahead and talk. Whatever you got to say to me won't come as any shock. I must be guilty of something. You just whisper it. Of course, I have to ask you about the recently released cast album. Have you yeah. listened to it? Are you excited about it? Yeah. Like, talk well, to me about that. Had it. We had it for a while, and I've been listening to it. And it's a beautiful, <laughs> it's a beautiful album. I mean, it's Bob Dylan, so 
we have that and we have beautiful musicians and, and singers and, and I, I love I love the music. The pangs the pangs of despised love, the laws delayed, the insolence of office. I know that um, you recently had a hashtag that went viral in a video that went viral where you were celebrating black artists. And yeah. Can you kind of talk about what are some things that you hope on the ground change about Broadway when you get back? I just hope that everyone is seen. I hope that everyone is seen um, as artists, and, but also as human beings. I think a lot of times we come together and we have fun doing our musicals, but we forget that, you know, when I walk outside the stage door, I'm a black woman and I have experiences that may be different from the audience members that are um, seeing the show every day. So I just want to remind people to keep that empathy button on. Keep, keep it pressed and, and, and keep thinking about others and, and, and community. The cast of Mrs. Doubtfire just had their first curtain call in 19 months. Of course, the new musical comedy is based on the 1993 movie starring Robin Williams. Rob McClure is in the title role. Mrs. Doubtfire began its Broadway run on March 9, 2020. COVID shut everything down three days later. Official opening night is December 5th. There's still a whole lot more to talk about on this edition of the Broadway Show. Coming up, The Missing Link, a deaf actor breaks through on Broadway, playing the role of a hearing character in Aaron Sorkin's To Kill a Mockingbird. This is the Broadway Show, and we're back in just a few. Almost Christmas time in the city, and that means the iconic Radio City Rockettes have kicked off their first rehearsals ahead of the holiday season. The annual production was canceled last year because of the pandemic, which makes this spectacular all the more spectacular. The Rockettes will be on stage from November 5th until January 2nd. It's so many pinch me moments almost on the hour. I mean, especially our very first day hearing the band play for the first time. I haven't heard live music in so long and I think just that experience of hearing like the band play and then the details that we're learning and us wanting to give the best possible performance to our audience, I mean, there's such a tangible energy to a live show. That has been my like biggest experience here is just been like the excitement of what live theater is. And it, to be a part of it is mm -hmm. like, I can't it's so magical. It. Yeah. This is my 11th season and I have the same pinch me moments. Yeah. For me, it's um, the first day we line up as a line up. And it is just like that first kick line we do as an mm. entire line is a pinch me moment for sure. So I get it yeah. even 11 seasons later. Aaron Sorkin's To Kill a Mockingbird is back on Broadway with original cast members Jeff Daniels and Celia Keenan Bolger. But there's another returning cast member who has broken new ground on Broadway. We're talking about Russell Harvard. Here's Paul with the story. Thanks, Tamsin. After making a splash in the off-Broadway drama Tribes almost a decade ago, deaf actor Russell Harvard has built an incredible career both on stage and on screen. Now he's bringing ASL to Aaron Sorkin's To Kill a Mockingbird after a long hiatus of self-discovery and making history along the way. What was the last year and a half like for you? I know you were doing the show, performing the show at the time of the shutdown. I had my downfall here after the Broadway shutdown. I'm sure many have felt this way too, uh, but it was like, what? wouldn't be a perfect time to address the things that I've been maybe um, were fearful of. But uh, I'm going to be open, completely transparent. So I'm in personal recovery. So I decided to go in to rehab. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the best decision I've ever made. And I've had many people that were supportive and very helpful with my new journey. If this I know, I hate to say, but if COVID didn't even happen, it, I mean, it's a black thing in disguise. I hate to say it. I was able to meet 
many deaf people in recovery and be able to go to meetings. It was, it, it was a, a very, um, I would say, a magical journey. So I'm happy that it happened. So how are you now? And, <laughs> and what is it like re-entering the world of Mockingbird? And do you feel there's like a new purpose to things? And how do you it, feel? It's surreal. It's surreal to be back in New York, I want to say. I didn't see when it would be happening. And now that um, I feel like I need more time at home, even though you already have so much time. Yeah. But I do want to say I'm grateful to uh, be given this opportunity because um, I am so much a life link. And um, in recovery, they teach you to uh, be a man of your law, just like that. And uh, before, you know, uh, I probably did it and you would be avoiding it, but now it's just like, and I see myself in other people's shoe, I'm an empath. You know, a lot has happened, and I just like feel the link in that character. So who better to play that role but me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've been able to do amazing things on, on the New York stage. What are you proudest of when you look at your journey, and what do you really hope to accomplish in the coming years? I wouldn't trade anything for what I'm doing. Um, I, I've often said I wanted to do Rocky Horror Picture Show, I wanted to play Frank and Further and have all the characters played by deaf actors. So one day, hopefully, we can do that on Broadway. And what's really exciting is that you are getting the opportunity to play roles that were not intended to be played by a deaf performer. Right. Talk about what that means for you and, and just for the community, what it means to have those opportunities. You don't have to be down to play that role. Just like what Bart Shea was trying to tell me, because I was trying to find the backstory of Link D. Like, how did he become that? Like, how I'm questioning, like, how did he meet his wife and everything? And he's like, he's not that. It's like, we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. And I think mini theater can follow that model and have the narrator help tell that story, mm -hmm. that line that I'm expressing. Because, you know, Scout and, and Dill and then Jim are speaking in my line, telling what I'm saying. I think many of you can do that. What is it like to be a part of a company where not everyone in the company can necessarily communicate with you 100%. Everyone in the room has been warm. Like, um, I mean, the beginning, obviously, it was a little late butterfly. Then when you're in the room, there's a jolt happening. And then now, it's just like a warm, ooey gooey feeling. Uh, and um, so I feel like that whole bump, mm -hmm. you know. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is a Broadway show. Welcome back to the Broadway show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get right to it. My name is Tidi Manye, and I play Rafiki in The Lion King. Rafiki is a shaman. Where I come from, he's called, he's, uh, she's called the Sangoma. And um, Rafiki foresees the nature, the future, the past. She's able to foretell, you know, what uh, it's like, like a like a medium. So that's what Rafiki does. When I got the call that I was supposed to, um, I was gonna do Rafiki. I felt like I was, I was lifted, like I was so excited in such a way that I, yeah, I couldn't believe it. It's something that I know about. I've lived the life before, and I've, you know, I've had uh, cousins and uh, aunties in my country that I are doing this you know kind of job where they can be able to you know talk to the past the, i'm sorry the ancestors and communicate with them so i was like after, after i got the role i was like oh my god in africa as a whole we have like different kind of ceremonies we have like a day where there's this ceremony of showing off what you you know you, what you can do with your face and whoever painted their face nice then they get to win I um, don't have to, I don't get to put it myself. We have a, I have a um, makeup artist that puts it on my face because I will mess it up. 
because it makes me, I don't know, it makes me feel truthful to my culture. Sometimes I would play like songs from home. They motivate me. They make me get into, sometimes get into character. And the other thing is that I'm speaking a language that nobody knows. And me clicking and saying, saying all those things, people are like, what, 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 what is that? How did she do that? So all of those things, they, I think they pump you out. Sometimes when they call five minutes, I have that, that little moment. You want to make sure that when you go there, you speak the truth. For those who have not seen the show, that little five minutes, I think it's just to calm yourself and say, listen, um, I guess now it's time for me to go and do my job and go and say, okay, this is, this is what you came here for. So I'm going to give you your money's worth. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.